Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Oh, I am Bob, and I am real glad to be here doing this thing. It's funny, I was sitting over there listening to her talk about my book, and I got embarrassed. It's amazing how we get embarrassed by things we do there. Uh, for those of you that are in 12-step recovery, this meeting tonight has nothing to do with it. <laughs> you know, so if you're waiting for somebody to read something, or someone to yell at somebody, or someone <laughs> to accuse someone of crying, of self-pity, it's not going to happen tonight. What I'm going to talk about tonight is, is codependency. Um, People might also expect me to talk about food, seeing as how we're doing this for an eating disorders house. But uh, there's a, at the back of all these issues, drug, drug addiction, alcohol um, addiction, uh, food addiction, eating disorder, um, whatever label you want to put on it, uh, are some core issues. And um, I think one of the things that I'm, I'm discovering as I go work, keep working on this stuff in order just to survive and have some kind of a life is that these issues go back to when I was real small, and it's very possible that it's these very issues of being raised in an alcoholic or a dysfunctional family are the one reasons that I used drugs and alcohol in the first place, that they were they were really the cause, the, the driving force in my life. <clears throat> so what the hell is codependency? Boy, that's a, you know, codependency. I don't know how it sounds to, to the girls, but to, to most guys it really sounds kind of wimp, you know? <laughs> Codependent, come on. I'm not codependent. I may be from a raging, insane family of alcoholics and overeaters, but I'm not codependent. I've got other problems, perhaps, but whatever codependency is, I'm not one. <laughs> well, how the hell did codependency come about? How did we find out about it? What is it? Well, it, <clears throat> we discovered it, in essence, when Sally and Bob brought Tommy, age 15, into adolescent drug treatment program and said, fix this kid, he's destroying the family. Or Mary and Sam brought Sally into Weight Watchers. <laughs> Sally is 14, 100 pounds overweight, has a mohawk pink haircut. <laughs> and, and they're saying, we can't understand, she's so obedient. She's such a good little girl, I can't understand why suddenly here she is, both sides of her head shaved and... You know, what do we do? This became such a pattern of repetition that eventually <clears throat> a few of the learned therapists out there who didn't have their heads stuck in their own codependency issues started to examine where these kids were coming from. And they kept finding out that fixing the kid wasn't going to fix the house. And they kept finding out they'd fix the kid and send him back to the home and the kid would be back. And they discovered that the, that the, the, the recovery rate of adolescent treatment programs, whether it be for drugs, alcohol, eating disorders, or anything else, was just about zero. Right at the bottom. One of the reasons it's right at the bottom is because they kept sending them back to the original dynamic duo. Mom and dad, brothers and sisters, sibling rivalry, the old homestead, okay? <clears throat> now, so now, you know, they look and they focus and they discover that, well, one of the issues that seems the core issue of all this stuff, according to a large number of people, and I happen to agree with them, is shame. Is shame. That, that as children, we were shamed. And that that shame is so deep. So, before I go on any further, I, I love stuff. We talk about a lot of stuff in recovery and in seminars and in everything. And everybody always nods and nobody has any idea what the hell it is that anybody's talking about, right? I mean, like, intimacy is the big word now, you know. Intimacy, oh, God, it can't be intimate. You know, I try, but I just don't know how. Oh, we work so hard to be intimate. We're just not getting there. Intimacy, the emerging issue. Intimacy, this. Intimacy, that. And I've, at seminars that I do, I ask the people there if they know what intimacy is. I've yet to have anyone raise their hand with an answer. No one knows what the hell intimacy is. Everybody's working on it. Everybody believes it's desirable, but nobody knows what the hell it is they're working on, and they don't know what it is they're after. And like so many things, with adult children, we'll never ask. 
See, because part of our disease is we think we're supposed to know. Because growing up as children, we were required to know stuff that children aren't required to know. So we think we got to know, so I won't ask. Do you have trouble being intimate, Bob? Yeah, God, I really do. You know, I, but I'm working on it. It's, it's something I really want to be. <laughs> I think. <laughs> Intimacy is very simply this. Intimacy is me being you, me, me being me, and letting you see me. That's all it is. They can write 100 million books about it. They can give 10,000 workshops on it. It comes down to one thing. Me being me and letting you see me. But we're not talking, we're talking about the real me now. We're not talking about all these people that we create and all these personalities in order to survive. The real me. Just letting you see me. That's it. That's intimacy. From there you can build the most powerful relationship or the most powerful friendship in all the world. Once you stop the pretense. Once you stop pretending. Okay. So that's intimacy. <clears throat> if you're going to work on these issues of codependency, adult children of alcoholic families, adult children of dysfunctional families, any label you want to hang on it, there's two or three things that I found are real interesting. <clears throat> First of all, there's a distinct difference between the alcoholic family and the dysfunctional family. Although both are, i.e., dysfunctional families, there's really a difference. And I think quite often, once you decide that it's necessary for you to work on these issues, that it's a little easier for the child from the alcoholic family to get started than it is for the child from the dysfunctional family. Because um, as a child from an alcoholic family, you have little tiny hidden memories to draw on. You know, um, it's like maybe you came in at five years old from playing baseball with your buddies and you got your bat and your glove and you, and you open the closet door to put your bat and your glove away, and here's Dad, <laughs> you know, standing in the closet, gl glassy-eyed, peeing on the shoes, you know. <laughs> so you go, you know, and Mom, of course, <clears throat> if he's the typical co-alcoholic in this situation, will run up, tell you that Dad's ill, sick. If he wasn't sick, he wouldn't be in there, and it's okay. It didn't happen. So the rest of your life, Dad is probably the only guy, unless you manage to do it yourself, that you've ever seen standing in the closet peeing on the shoes. Or you've come home and Mom has passed out on the back porch with her head in the dryer looking like she's been guillotined, you know, like she has no head. So, so you try and push these little things aside. But once you begin these recovery issues, these little memories float through. You remember Dad standing there and you go, yeah, it's the only Dad I ever saw do that. Or mom, you know, jacked out on the on the back porch. But if you're from a dysfunctional family, the interesting thing about <clears throat> dysfunctional families is so often they look good. They appear very, very well to the to the outside world. I mean, they look okay. Um, more often than not, in a dysfunctional family, the father will be a workaholic. You know, and so he gets praised for for his efforts. I mean, and you will be told as a child how lucky you are that your father worked so hard to provide this house and these clothes and this food and 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 uh, uh, these automobiles and these school. I mean, they'll tell you. Meanwhile, you're three years old running up to the get guy at the gas station saying, Daddy, Daddy, because you have no idea what Daddy looks like. You haven't seen him in three years. You know, he's never goddamn there because he's always at work. But they're telling you how wonderful he is. And you're going off with the milkman. You know, oh, Dad, Dad. I love you, Dad. Often in dysfunctional families, the father is a workaholic. The mother will be a, 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 a charity-aholic or a volunteer-aholic. I mean, she's out there, you know. She's like at the Girl Scouts and the Cub Scouts and the, and the Volunteers of America and the thing and the thing and the PTA and the thing. And she's been doing everything. So you have a real good-looking family. Busy, too. Everybody's busy. This is quite often a family which honors the feelings of its children. <laughs> but they will have a discussion at the dinner table. Interesting place, huh? Let's have a little stress at the table. Um, <laughs> and alcoholics. I mean, needless to say, you want, if you have a little eating disorder, you're a sober alcoholic, you might want to think back to the mealtime at your house. I don't know about your house, man, but there's a lot of food moved through the air in my house, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
Dad didn't like something, had no problem expressing his dissatisfaction with dinner. You know, there it would go. <clears throat> but dysfunctional family, they'll have meal time, and this will be the time that, pe- that this is the family discussion time. This is time for the children to express themselves. Any anything that's going wrong, you know, or they're unhappy with, or just generally talk to mom and dad, you know, get it down to buddies, you know. I didn't need a buddy, I needed a mother and a father, you know. Of course, they never asked me what I thought anyway. My house wasn't like this. I have friends who grow up in a house like this. But the interesting thing is, in dysfunctional families, there's a cardinal rule when you bring up the topics at the dinner table. You may bring up and discuss anything that does not put the parents under stress. (laughs) But you very, very young learn, don't bring up things that put the parents under stress. Okay, so... There are some major rules that exist in alcoholic and dysfunctional families. And we grow up with these. And this is also a major rule of shame. I can't remember who. I think it was Folsom and what's his name that pointed out in the book on shame. It is that <clears throat> the cardinal rule is very simply this. If you love me, if you really love me, you will never be in conflict with me. That may be great for robots but it's unreal with human beings. Now, the other thing about little Sally, who they brought into Weight Watchers to try and thin her down, the thing that stuns the parents so much is that she's always been obedient. Damn, she's a good girl. She minds her parents. She minds her teachers. She's an obedient child. We can't understand this. One little abnormality here, you know, 300 additional pounds, one small abnormality in the family. Fix this kid and everything will be okay. So a real high price is placed on obedience. It's, I don't know if this is true or not, but there are an awful lot of experts in the eating disorders field that say most people with eating disorders come from strict homes, from strict families. I think there's real good examples in the news right now that if you think that rigidity is the answer, it's bullshit, it doesn't work. Ask Jimmy Swigert. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a great idea, but you just can't do it if you're a human being. You know? I mean, it's a wonderful concept. It's a hell of a concept. It's unfortunate that it doesn't work for people. And every one of these guys that gets out there, man, go bends up. You got to break eventually. You can't do it if you're a human being. You can't be that rigid. Yet one of the real rules of, of both of, of dysfunctional families is rigidity. We're rigid families, man. Things are done on time and in order, and you know there's rules and clocks and schedules and charts and gold stars for good behavior. And I mean, you got a lot of stuff going on for a kid who just wants to stand there and go. Pfft. You know, basically expresses satisfaction with life. But we place, ironically enough, we have reached a point in society where we place a real high premium on obedience and teaching, pedagogy, gaji. I never can, is anyone, is there anyone here who actually knows how that word is pronounced? Really knows the proper pronunciation? No. So it's either pedagogy or pedagogy. And it means teaching for those of you who, you know, don't know that, which I had to look it up. And I I didn't understand the first definition that I read. So, obedience. God, I mean, we should really be obedient. I think that's wonderful. I think obedience is critical. I think it's a very good thing. Don't you? And and let you must, unless you're the acting out child, because um, you're here. Our guests were mostly priests of every sort. As the years passed, my father's religious fervor increased. Whenever time permitted, he would take me on pilgrimages to all the holy places in our own country, as well as to Einselden in Switzerland and to Lourdes in France. Well, that's a nice, good good father-son relationship. Dad is religious, has strong beliefs, takes his son to holy places. He prayed passionately that the grace of God might be bestowed on me so that I might one day become a priest, blessed by God. Well, there's a few households in this country also that want 
their sons to be priests, pardon me, to um, grow up in the church, be obedient. I, too, was as deeply religious as was possible for a boy of my age, and I took my religious duties very seriously. I prayed with true childlike gravity and performed my duties as acolyte with great earnestness. I had been brought up by my parents to be respectful and obedient toward all adults, and especially the elderly, regardless of their social status. I was taught that my highest duty was to help those in need. It was constantly impressed upon me in forceful terms, key word to this whole thing, in forceful terms that I must obey promptly the wishes and commands of my parents, teachers, and priests, and indeed of all adults, including servants, and that nothing must distract me from this duty. Whatever they said was always right. These basic principles by which I was brought up became second nature to me. Well, I mean, there you go, man. Who wouldn't want this kid? Obedient? God. Promptly obey the wishes and commands of parents and teachers and priests, all adults? Damn. Good kid. His name was Rudolf Hess. These are his personal writings. He was a commandant of Auschwitz, where he put some 367,000 people to death. He was obedient. A good boy. How many times have you read in the newspaper when somebody climbs up in a tower with a gun and kills 14 goddamn people, the neighbors and parents all stand around and say, we don't understand it. He was such a good boy. Always minded. I remember when the guy climbed up in the tower in Texas, his mother said, and he didn't even, you know, cry when we hit him. <laughs> Eichmann was raised in the same kind of home. This, this stuff is out of a book called For Your Own Good by a German psychiatrist by the name of Alice Miller. If you're from a dysfunctional family, I heartily recommend this book. I recommend it if you're from an alcoholic family also. But particularly if you're from just a dysfunctional family where you have at least no, no recall of any alcoholism in your, in your parents. Because she, I think, did a really smart thing. She said, let's take some real good examples <laughs> of these issues known to all of us. And talk about it, you know, instead of talking about Joe Smith, you know, Joe, Joe S., case number 412, she figured that they had some real good people to work from over there in Germany. <laughs> Eichmann was raised in the same kind of home, to be obedient. The rules are what's important. Obey the damn rules. Nothing else matters. And when they took him to Israel and they tried him, he sat there for weeks on end in that courtroom. He listened to people eyeball to eyeball get on that stand who had been in camps under his control, who had their families had been murdered, they had been tortured, and he never cracked a smile. He never made one expression change in his face. And when it was pointed out to him that he neglected to stand up for the reading of the verdict, as is required in court, he blushed. He was embarrassed. He forgot to obey the rule. Okay, so, come on. I mean, you know, Mom and Dad weren't that bad, and Dad didn't drink that much, and how the hell important is it anyway, all this stuff? Give it a rest, will you, Bob, for Christ's sakes? You're up there talking about this crap. Let's live in today. Huh? <laughs> you know, let's just knock it off. I mean, this stuff's got no relevancy to my life today. What happens to you when in your childhood is not important. It's of no significance. Work the damn steps and shut up. <laughs> it just isn't... I mean, well, come on, let's be logical, okay? My God. <sighs> That's a long time ago. I mean, stop sniveling. Get on with your life. Stop trying to blame your parents. Why? <laughs> I don't choose to. <laughs> I'm not really blaming them. I just hold them responsible. <laughs> so, you know, you're a kid. A couple of things go wrong. You know, lighten up. See, the, the thing that's happening in this country, which which I rejoice in, is the fact that finally somebody has stuck a pin in the boil 
and, and the pus has started to come out. And as much as we have tried to hide it as a nation, it's up. The lid is off on the child abuse, wife abuse, sexual abuse to children, and it isn't pretty. Okay? But it's up. It's coming up. And now we gotta look at it. And now we gotta deal with it. And we don't like it. And I gotta tell you, we got nothing to be proud about as a nation. I don't have the statistics, but they're staggering. And as a backlash to all this push to try and stop it, you have some of the southern states which are repealing their child abuse laws. George is one that repealed most of them, and in the first year, last year, the deaths from child abuse in Georgia tripled. Tripled. Okay? Children be, but come on, Bob, we'll get off that crap, will you? I spent ten bucks, I came here to have a good time and donate to a good cause. I don't want to hear that. It's not important what happens to you when you're a child! Stop that! Uh, geez, Adolf Hitler grew up in a good house. <laughs> Religious parents. Strict parents. Well, we can't blame the whole goddamn thing on that. You know, I mean, Alice Miller, if you read another one of her books called Drama, The Gifted Child, in essence, what she says in it, if Hitler had had children, we wouldn't have had World War II. But he didn't have anybody to dump it on. <laughs> <clears throat> we lost two already. I wonder how many more we can get. <laughs> Wasn't a funny a, a talk. God, I'm sorry about that. Um, living in his household with him was a schizophrenic, hunchback aunt by the name of Joanna. Okay? Now, a child in a home where there's communication, where the child can express himself without fear of losing the parent's love, okay, can grow up with a hunchback, schizophrenic aunt and do just fine. I mean, if little Adolf could have come in from the backyard and said to mother, Mom, Aunt Joanna's sitting in the backyard in the tree naked, and it's embarrassing. And mother could say, yes, Aunt Joanna is in the backyard, she is in the tree, she is naked, and it is embarrassing. <laughs> and I'm embarrassed, and the neighbors are embarrassed. <laughs> but... Aunt Johanna listens to a different drummer than we do. <laughs> and she just likes to sit in the tree. He was never allowed to say anything to anybody. He was raised in a very, very strict home. Very strict home. There are letters from housekeepers who quit because of this aunt. Said, I can't stand one more day with that crazy hunchback, or however the letter was worded. I forget. From one of the housekeepers. She just said, screw this, I quit. But he couldn't quit. He's stuck there. He can't say anything, and he can't quit, but God damn it, it's not important. When he came to power in Germany, he put to death all of the mentally ill and all of the mentally retarded. 87,000 mentally handicapped people he put to death. I'd say he got evil with Aunt Joanna. I'd say he got evil. See, the stuff is there. You can't pretend... It doesn't exist. Now, here's a real interesting thing that happens when you're being raised in one of those kinds of homes. They want control, and control means that things have got to go on the same way, day in, day out, day after day, and keep it smooth no matter what, see? I mean, that becomes real important. So that becomes the codependent's role in life. Fix it. And that means fix the other person. By the way, before I go any further, because I forget I can't remember who gave this definition. It might have been Branchon. The very best definition of codependency I've ever heard, if you're wondering what it is, is someone who lives their entire life focused outside of themselves. I mean, that's what it is. If you're happy, I'm happy. You're sad, I'm sad until I get you fixed. <laughs> I am the clothes I wear, I'm the car I drive, I'm the house I live in, I'm what I do for a living. I am the body I have. I am, I am, I am. You know, it's outside. Whatever's outside of me is who I am. Okay? Well, that's a very little blackboard, isn't it? <laughs> How observant you are, Bob. I don't know that that's real visible in the back. <laughs> um, well, they said it was small. I... <laughs> And I always, you know, everyone's perception of small is different. <laughs> I just finished doing a seminar in a hospital in San Jose, and, you know, the blackboard was 
So I figured small, you know, <clears throat> here we go again. Okay. There is apparently a God-given natural rhythm to life which is unchangeable and undeniable. The rhythm exists in the universe and it exists in the emotional life of people. And that rhythm is this. The codependent will spend their entire life trying to turn this into this. Very difficult, particularly if you understand probably the most profound summation of life is summed up in the bumper sticker that says shit happens. <laughs> you know, you run out the door, the car don't start, man. <laughs> it just don't start. You know? The phones don't work. The power lines go out. The company loses its contract, you're out of work. I mean, stuff just happens. Now, the drug addict, alcoholic, of course, once they got past this stage, you know, <laughs> which is just an overreaction to the inability to do it this way, okay, use the drugs and alcohol to try and get this. It's really all we're trying to do. It's everybody I ever talked to. Now, another real fascinating thing to me is this. If you go to a meeting for chemical dependent people, whether the meeting is about drugs or whether it's about alcohol or, you know, about food, whatever it is, but particularly drugs and alcohol, and somebody begins to share about their first experience with drugs and alcohol, they will always, always, 98% of the time, say the following. Well, you know, man, it made me feel taller. made me feel prettier. made me feel sexier. made me feel stronger. Made me feel okay. Made me feel handsomer. Made me feel smarter. Made me feel something. So, we have ingested into our bodies a chemical that made me feel different. And yet, in recovery, feelings are never discussed. Something's wrong, guys. Something's wrong. If I almost died taking this chemical, which alters how I feel, and I'm not talking about feelings when I'm trying to get, get well from this, I mean, whoa, wait a minute, <clears throat> something's wrong. I understand that a lot of what this is about can put you under stress and make you uncomfortable. And I don't apologize for that. I just want you to understand that I know that. And if some of this stuff is upsetting and makes you angry and makes you back up into denial, and if you're a parent yourself and you realize you passed on the same shit that was passed on to you no matter how bad you didn't want to do it, this is not going to be a fun evening. Okay? But it's not meant to be. It's not meant to be. Because you can die having a good time here. You know, the perception of a good time which is not feeling anything. You know, it's that, it's again, it's that thing. See, let's talk about shame for a minute because I think shame gets to, shame comes back to this whole control this comes back to the, to the to the Jimmy Baker, Jimmy Swigert, this whole kind of thing, too. If I am ashamed of me, then I have a need to present to you somebody that does things well. So, if I am a, a dad and, and I have a child, then I'm not going to do with my child what was done to me. I'm going to make my child a good child. And it's real important that my child be a good child. And I'm never going to do to my child what my dad did to me. I'm not going to strike that child. Okay, now I'm, this is not a pact I'm making with you, the child, verbally, or with the wife or mother. This is an internal pact I'm making with me. This pact, this, this deal I'm making, this contract I'm signing with me is critical. Pardon me. It's essential to how I feel about myself. So, I'm going along and I'm being dad. You know? And I'm being a pretty good dad, but you know, the kid, God, Damn, he just, sometimes he just infuriates. But it's okay. I'm going along being pretty good. I mean, you know, he didn't have to paint, you know, his name on the side of the garage. I mean, it was, but it's okay, you know, and I, I'll paint it over and it's all right. And God damn it, today at work, oh God, what a lousy day at work. And then the kid wants the thing and then I, God damn it, and I've hit him. 
I have released. The moment I hit him, I let it go. I released. Blue. But now I'm so ashamed of what I've done. I failed. I failed the secret pact I made with myself. I now I got to tell him it'll never happen again. And inside of myself, I make the resolution I am going to do it better this time. I'm going to do it stronger this time. Well, the end result of that kind of control is disaster. You break. And if you don't break exercising that much control, you rot to death 30 years before your time. I'm absolutely thoroughly convinced that 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 I, I call codependency the toxic waste dump of the 20th century. I believe it is. It, it kills people. You don't have to drink to die behind it. You can just sit quietly home and rot to death. And think of members of your families that you've known and neighbors and people, man, that just could just held it in and just held it down and just repressed it and just died. Just died. Now, understand this, too. Because this can be real depressing. You think, God, i got so far to go and I haven't worked on any of these issues and you're right, my family was nuts. <laughs> and I think I'm just going to go out and suck on the exhaust pipe of my car <laughs> and give it up. I was reading a paper the other day. I can't remember what the hell the name it was. But in, in, in essence, this guy's concept was this. That over here, we have wellness. Okay? And over here, we have sickness. Or illness. Now, it would, doesn't matter what we're talking about here, whether it's physical, mental, emotional, you know, we've got wellness, we've got sickness. And that it's absolutely, completely unimportant where in this space you are. It doesn't matter where you are, whether you're right up here kissing wellness or down here dying in, in illness. It only matters which direction you're going. That's all that matters. Which direction are you going? So, I mean, your whole life can suck swamp water right now. You know, I mean, you can be completely goddamn miserable. That's not the point. Which direction are you going? Are you still going that way? Or did you just stop eating red meat? Or did you just give up cigarettes? Or did you just start seeing a therapist? Or did you just do something that's starting to point you towards wellness? If you did, that's all that matters. Which direction are you going? Going up, going down. Okay, so... What are some of the co- I better read some of this codependency. Oh yeah, before I get too deep in this, and some of you are parents want to kill me because I'm a parent. Actually, I'm a brand new parent. I have a four week old baby girl. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, whoa. Sleep has become a memory in my household. <laughs> I hadn't shaved in about three days. I was standing at the ticket counter at the airport in Albuquerque this morning trying to change my seat. The girl looked at me and she said, did you have a bad night? You know, because I look really bad. I, guess I usually wear blue denim shirts and pants, sort of a convict look I'm comfortable with. And <laughs> when I travel, I got this three days growth of beer, and I'm standing there at the counter, and she's bad night. I said, no, I'm, I'm just a new father, and my life has reduced itself to the point where I have to make decisions like, do I want to shave before I shower in the morning, or do I want to sleep five more minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I opted, I opted for the five minutes of sleep. I am thrilled and delighted to be a father. It's a planned child. It's, some, it's, it's, it's what we wanted. Um, uh, my, uh, my wife, um, interesting, she's raised by two alcoholic parents and, uh, who basically destroyed the two older children. Her older sister died when she was about 35 or 36 from cancer. And when they told her she had it, she just didn't do anything about it. You know, it was like, <clears throat> which tells you a lot about her self-esteem and what happened to her. And so uh, by the time it got to my, my wife, although they did, did a lot of things wrong, they left her alone. <laughs> they just sort of said, you're okay as you are, <laughs> you know. You want to be an artist, paint. You, wanna, you don't want to go to school, screw it. You don't have to go to school. We'll get you a tutor. We'll take you someplace. I mean, in essence, they just said, oh, screw it. You know, and we're not doing well here. <clears throat> and uh, and they saw that. So so as a result, she she despite growing up with all the chemical dependencies and a lot of the problems that you get in an alcoholic household. She also had some of the bonuses that most people don't get in an alcoholic household. 
So when we found out, we got the phone call, this is a number of months ago after we had the amniocentesis done to find out the baby was okay, we also wanted to know what it is. We had, neither one of us had any desire to keep it a secret. It just sort of seemed silly to us. We wanted to know who was in there and who we were talking to and, you know, instead of it, you know, we could say she, her, and start thinking about a name. And, uh, so we get the phone call and, and they say, oh, it's a girl. And, uh, we had wanted a son real bad, both of us. And so we got, took us about, eh, 10, 15 minutes talking, really talking, real honestly, to both of us about our disappointment that it wasn't, wasn't a boy, and to get that verbalized and get it out. And then she looked at me and she started to cry. And I said, God, what's the matter? And she said, I don't, I don't know how to teach a daughter to fit in. <laughs> I have no idea. And I looked at her and I said, but we don't want her to fit in. <laughs> I mean, I hope to hell I have to go to school three times a week because they're, she's questioning what they're doing. You know, I mean, I don't want her to fit in. I don't want her to be, and I don't want her to fit in. I want to find out who the hell she is. Okay? One of the concepts that, well, of a lot of people, but one of the ones that, that, um, that, that Alice Miller puts forth in the drama The Gifted Child, another book brilliantly, is that the children are put here to teach us. You know, she said, <clears throat> you, get, you get the whole world focusing on Jesus Christ, but if you want to talk about parenting, let's look at Mary and Joseph. So they're the perfect parents. They knew it was a child of God. They knew it was a child of God. And although he went places they had never been before in their lives, and he did things that frightened them, they just went along and supported them. They never stopped them. They never interfered. They knew their child was put to teach them. To teach them. It's what the children are for. Okay, so anyway, before we get beat the parents up anymore, <laughs> did I get you? Hmm? Alexandra Fortune. We have no idea where Fortune came from. Now, for those of you, some of you will think I went over the line on this one, in other words, you will understand. <clears throat> before before she was born, not long before she was born, about a month, uh, we, we had a, two or three real beautiful things happen with her. It was like, my wife is an artist and she belongs to, a, she was in a, in a group therapy thing for a little while in Santa Fe with other artists. And money was, was, was a real issue with us. And, cause I had had a lot of disasters in, in Southern California, all adult child related. You know, you know, if you don't have self-esteem, you have no sense of self, then you don't, you don't know how to take care of self. So although you can make a, an extravagant amount of money and an awesome amount of money, uh, I didn't know how to take care of me. I mean, I didn't know that you that you take care of yourself, that you that you put money aside, that you that you arrange a life that has some security, a few things in it. Not a lot, just a little bit of sense, you know. Because I I didn't. I mean, I grew up on the couch in the living room. I mean, I, they never cared enough to get me a room, you know, on my own. I just slept on the couch, so I got no sense of that. So I I picked people to handle my money who were not too adept, and um, but they were nice, <laughs> nice people. <laughs> they like me. <laughs> Fortunately, I went bankrupt personally, and my bankrupt my corporation. So by the time the baby's rolling in, and we just bought a house in Santa Fe, and a lot of stuff's going on, we're like, oh, God, what are we going to do for the money with this baby? And so she said this at this group. She said, you know, what's that, you know, the, look at the baby coming, and the baby needs so much, and, you know, money's really tight right now. And this wonderful little old lady in the group came up to her, this little artist, and said, no, no. She said, you must understand, there's nothing to fear. She said, if you let them. If you let them, babies bring into your life everything they need before they come, if you let them. And we started to watch, and I'll be a son of a bitch. People just were showing up from everywhere, you know. These people had a stroller. These people had some baby clothes. These people had a bed. These, and these are people we didn't even know. You know, they just kept pouring stuff. In, and we just watched the stuff pour in, you know. Tina's girlfriends gave her a big shower in L.A. and they, being smart, gave her cash instead of gifts that, you know, so she could get what she needed for the baby and we'd go out and shop and, you know, buy. And we just watched the stuff just start to stack up around the house. So one day we're out in a furniture store and just looking at some of the furniture and uh, suddenly I'm like, my attention is like drawn like this and I turn like this and I, it's a huge consignment warehouse. It's, and I, you know, I walk down this aisle and this aisle and this aisle and over this piece of furniture and around this rocking chair and down this I have no idea where I'm going, but I live a lot off intuition now and I, and I know I'm going somewhere, you know. And, and we had already known that we're going to name, we, we already knew we we're going to name her Alexandra Fortune. 
and not why, we just knew that was going to be your name. And finally, I wind up face to face with this wall at the far end of this consignment warehouse where the stuff nobody really wants ever to buy is, but they've taken it because they're nice guys. And hanging on the wall in front of me is a 19 framed 1945 cover from Fortune magazine. And on it, it has a little girl. And it has a movie camera, and it has some riding boots. My wife loves to ride. As soon as the kid's old enough to sit up, she'll be on a horse. And um, and a couple of three other things. Now, what's the significance of the movie camera? Well, some friends of ours in Santa Fe who teach a course on how to handle children, touching and moving, and so that they can move, you know, on their own instead of picking them up like a board, like we usually do, giving them no sense of, of up. You know, we don't we don't stop to understand their up is, is not the same as ours if they're laying down. So first you sit them up, then you pick them up, you know. And they wanted, they came and got Alexandra and used her for a videotape. I'm just watching the, I bought the cover and brought it home, and, and, I'm, and I'm watching the little images on this cover be fulfilled. Then I, now, I, I, my perception is she bought the cover, even though she hadn't been born yet. Now, you can do with that what you want. <laughs> you can go back to the Alano Club and say, he, yeah, he did it. He went right... <laughs> He went right past the mark. <clears throat> we knew he would. We've been saying for years. Got to really make a lot of people mad that I just keep feeling better, getting healthier, being happier. <laughs> the little one's displays of temper as indicated by screaming or crying without cause should be regarded as the first, tense, first test of your spiritual and pedagogical principles. Once you have established that nothing is really wrong, that the child is not ill, distressed, or in pain, then you can rest assured that the screaming is nothing more than an outburst of temper, a whim, the first appearance of willfulness. Now, you should no longer simply wait for it to pass, as you did in the beginning, but should proceed in a somewhat more positive way, by quickly diverting its attention by stern words, threatening gestures, rapping on the bed. For if none of this helps by appropriately mild corporate admonitions repeated persistently at brief intervals until the child quiets down or falls asleep. Simply put, keep hitting the kid until he shuts up. This procedure will be necessarily only once or at most twice. And then you will be master of the child forever. From now on, a glance, a word... A single threatening gesture will be sufficient to control the child. Remember that this will be the greatest benefit, this will be of the greatest benefit to you and your child since it will spare him many hours of agitation detrimental to his successful growth. Freeing him from all those inner torments that can moreover very easily lead to a proliferation of character traits that will become increasingly difficult to conquer. If parents are consistent in this, they will soon be rewarded by the emergency of that desirable situation in which the child will be controlled almost entirely by a parental glance alone. Children raised in this way frequently do not notice, even at an advanced age when someone is taking advantage of them, as long as the person uses a friendly tone of voice. This is written in Advice to Parents, written 130 years ago. A hundred and thirty years ago. You want to know where all this stuff started? It didn't start with mom and dad. They just passed on to you, man, what was passed on to them. And eventually, in this process of dealing with these issues and recovering from these issues, there comes a day when you will see your mother or your father, envision them in your mind, both, as a small child standing in front of their house where they grew up in either a little dress or a little sailor suit or something. And they're just wide-eyed and they're just filled with hopes and dreams and excitement and energy and awe, just like you were when you were a little child. And their, their parents smashed that spontaneity in them, just like they smashed it in you. When you reach that place <clears throat> in dealing with these issues, you will have achieved something that's called forgiveness. Forgiveness is an emotion. Forgiveness comes in the heart. It's not an intellectual concept. 
It cannot be hurried. There is a lot of anger to get through before we get to the forgiveness. In my opinion, any time you're with a therapist and they're rushing... Now, remember, most therapists are fucked up, okay? I mean, understand that going in. <clears throat> I've never met a, co- a, a therapist yet that wasn't a codependent. I mean, they did not get into that field because that they had a genuine desire to help humanity. They're the little helpers trying to fix everything, and they got in that field because it's the only goddamn place that they were safe and could fulfill, you know, this need. So most of them are right over the line, which is okay. You understand that the, that the adult child has a very sick need for its heroes to be perfect. I mean, there are thousands upon thousands of people now that will never listen to another word that Jimmy Baker has to say or that Jimmy Schweigert has to say. And that's sad. That's really sad. I mean, whether you believe in what he believes in or not, or, or, or what any of them believe in, they, they gave a lot of people hope. And they made a lot of people cry. And they filled a lot of people with emotion. And they made a lot of things happen. So the guy gets nailed in a motel with a hooker. Come on. So what? I mean, you're going to blow out all the goddamn missionaries? Missions started all over the world. All the children being fed. All the people being clothed. All the money being poured out. You know, screw the fact that they make you come to come to their God or their belief before they feed you or clothe you. That's unimportant. They're feeding you or clothing you. I mean, he's done a lot of good. And just he gets nailed with one bride in one motel and it's over. There isn't an adult child in the congregation that's going to stick with him. Not one. I need my heroes to be perfect because I need for me to be perfect. I need for me to be in control. And if you're not, I'm going to throw you away. Man, if you do it with him, guess who, guess who else you'll do it with? Guess who else you throw away every time you don't make it? Every time you're not perfect? Every time you can't live up to this invisible set of rules that you set for yourself? Throw yourself away. You need for your heroes to be perfect. Nobody is. Nobody. So, it don't matter that your therapist is not perfect. My, my preference for a therapist is, when I come in with a really tearing, gut-wrenching, killing, abusive... I mean, when I finally got to the fact that it took me seven years of therapy to get to the fact that my mother had beat me senseless day in and day out for the three and a half years from age two to age five and a half. I mean, mercilessly beat me. So bad I couldn't... Even, I didn't attend enough school to get a grade my first year of school. When I finally hit on that one, and my mother, uh, my, mother my therapist, so same thing... <laughs> waited years. I mean, she waited years for me to get to this one, and she knew I had it at the gate coming in the door, but she just waited and waited and waited. And the day I hit that, and the day I returned to that little tiny child on her couch, cover, you know, folded up in a ball with my knees tucked into my stomach and covering my head and, and trying to flick the blows away with my hand and crying because I was being beaten by this woman... When I finally came out of that and I looked at her, she had tears streaming down her face. See, because she felt the pain. That's what I want in a therapist. You know, if you want to, if you want to heal from these issues, find somebody who's had them. The last thing any of us need is a quiet, aloof, dignified person, detached. I was raised by them. You know? I don't need that. I need somebody who's right in there with me. So, if your therapist is in the process of working on these issues themselves, you got a good deal. you got a good deal. See? Because they're right there. And they can share with you what they're going through. And my contention is this. Anytime I've ever encountered a therapist who's rushing somebody to forgive, it's because you're dealing with issues they haven't dealt with and they're uncomfortable. And they want you to hurry up. Get off this issue. You should forgive your dad. Why? I ain't done yet. <laughs> I gotta make a few more trips to the cemetery. I got a couple of more things to say, you know. <laughs> so watch for people that are rushing you into forgiveness. Very dangerous. The other thing too is to understand about adult children. We lost a lot of stuff as children. One of the things we lost is our childhood. Most children who grow up in alcoholic homes grow up quick. We become adults fast. We never get the chance to be a child. Never. So we have to be a child now. 
guess who dressed me, you know. <laughs> okay? So, but we'll get to childhood later. It's okay. It's a lot of fun. I mean, it's like I told my best friend, I call him on the phone. I have to, I got the baby home from the hospital. I say, you know what, man? You know what? I, as nuts as this sounds, I cannot wait to sit in the backyard in the mud with my girl. I want to go sit in the mud, you know, just sit in the mud with my daughter and just sit there and just, you know, play in the damn mud, man. I'm, I can't wait to do that. I never got to do that when I was a kid. You know, I'd be neat and orderly, you know, in line, whatever. You know, you gotta, <laughs> I get going. I lose sight of where I am. What am I saying? Hmm. Boy, it seemed important at the time. Does anyone know where I was? <laughs> Probably not. At this point, the stress gets really great. Um, oh, right. We're never children. We lost our childhood. So what the hell is the point of that? Um, um, I don't know. No, I've, I got past don't rush forgiveness. Childhood. Childhood shame. Childhood. Never children. We really lost our childhood. Yeah, I know. We had to grow up fast. I got all that, but the rest won't come. So, well, if you buy the tape, you buy the tape for five seventy-five. We got twenty-five cents worth of blank. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I know, and I can't pull it. It won't pull back. Um, hmm. Oh yeah, no, the mud was what got me gone. That's. <laughs> I'm still. I'm still in the mud. That's the problem. <laughs> I was suddenly back home with, with wife and baby, and it's like, oh, okay. Well, if you want to know some of what you're working against, this is some of what you're working against. It's also part of poisonous pedagogy to impart to the child from the beginning false information and beliefs that have been passed on from generation to generation and dutifully accepted by the young, even though they are not only unproven, but are demonstrably false. Examples of such beliefs are a feeling of duty produces love. Hatred can be done away with by forbidding it. <laughs> parents deserve respect simply because they are parents. Children are undeserving of respect simply because they are children. Obedience makes a child strong. A high degree of self-esteem is harmful. A low degree, a low degree of self-esteem makes a person altruistic. Tenderness or doting is harmful. Responding to a child's needs is wrong. Severity and coldness are a good preparation for life. A pretense of gratitude is better than honest ingratitude. The way you behave is more important than the way you really are. Neither parents nor God would survive being offended. The body is something dirty and disgusting. Strong feelings are harmful. Parents are creatures free of drives and guilt. Parents are always right. I mean, you know, little things. You wonder how you, why you doubt yourself? Why you have no self-esteem? It starts with little tiny things like, you don't have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and the kid stands there, and I don't. I wonder what the hell that feeling is. <laughs> so you push it down. What's codependency? My good feelings about who I am stem from being liked by you. My good feelings about who I am stem from receiving approval from you. Your struggle affects my serenity. My mental attention focuses on solving your problems or relieving your pain. Good way to describe codependence if you got one of them in a relationship. Well, you can get you can get a little more living in than if you have two of them in a relationship. Not much more living, but some more. But if you have two in a live in in a relationship, you you have a lot of trouble getting out the door. You know, it's like I'd like to go to a movie tonight. Would you? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, what would you like to see? I, I don't know. What would you like to see? Maybe something funny? Yeah, a comedy might be nice. Um, yeah, okay, I guess so. What? Well, I don't know. What would you... Um, well, maybe we should get a bite to eat first. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's let's do that. Uh, what do you want to get? Um, she's... I, I don't know. Um, what about you? What would you, what would you like to get? Well, you know, it's 9.30 now, you know, and... Uh, so uh, you throw the goddamn uh, frozen dinner in the oven and sit and look at each other and wonder why life is so boring, you know. 
My mental attention is focused on pleasing you. My mental attention is focused on protecting you. My mental attention is focused on manipulating you to do it my way. My self-esteem is bolstered by solving your problems. My self-esteem is bolstered by relieving your pain. My own hobbies and interests are put aside. My time is spent sharing your interests and hobbies. Your clothing and personal appearance are dictated by my desires as I feel you are a reflection to me. Now, that's, this is all what they read at CODA or codependency meetings. There's some, a flip side of that is that my clothing uh, is, uh, and personal appearance are dictated by your desires because I feel that I'm a reflection of you. I mean, I've been married seven times. Um, if you look through my closet, I probably have five different types of clothes at home. I have been taken out and dressed by one wife after the other, you know, uh, having no real idea what I like at all, you know. And so it's like I have just a whole lot of, I mean, you got right, you've been taking shopping lately, guys? Hey, well, that looks really nice on you. You should buy that. Oh, I don't know. It's not really, oh yeah, great. Okay, fuck, I'll buy it. You know, and out the door you go. Well, I bought more stuff. I remember once I was in a relationship with a real young girl, I thought real tight pants were nice. You know, and I was about 45 then, and I got more tight jeans. And I mean, I couldn't even sit down in the goddamn jeans. You know, my, I mean, what's the old joke? They're tired of my skin. You know, I can sit down in my skin. <laughs> you know, I can't sit down in pants. But, you know, what they wanted me to wear, so I wore it. <laughs> Tina has a great concept about buying clothes. Either really love it, either you really love it or leave it on the rack. You know, and I'm finding that's wonderful because I don't really know what I like yet. I know I like loose clothes for the most part. I like really comfortable stuff, baggy stuff. And like these pants are really too tight for me. But I got pregnant along with my wife, too. I put on about 20 pounds. She pisses me off. She's got most of hers off. I got a little to go yet. <clears throat> but uh, um, I don't really know what I like to wear. And I had to learn another thing. I like a lot of things I won't wear. I thought if I liked it, I had to buy it. You see, you get, you get brought up in that rigidity. And you think that you got to, you know, you think you got you to gotta do, you got to do. So I'd see something I like. I said, boy, I really like that. That's great. You know, but I buy it, but then I would never wear it once. I put it on, look at it in the mirror, and go, oh no, I can't wear this. Put it back in the closet. Like, you know, those old duster coats they wear in the great westerns. Those great, real. I mean, I love those coats. You know, the ones like Jesse James. Everybody's so, wearing those coats. You wear every now and then. I will see somebody in town, Santa Fe, wearing one. You know, it's like this oil skin, oil down, whatever. It's wonderful. Don't know if I'd ever wear one. I really like them. I mean, i got to find out because I'm really hooked on this coat. I don't know what the hell I'm going to do about it yet, but I'll let you know. Next time you come around, I'm wearing one. I mean, you know, it's... Uh... <laughs> Would I do that? Probably. <clears throat> Your behavior is dictated by my desires as I feel you're a reflection of me. Um, the flip side of that is my behavior is dictated by your desires because I feel I'm a reflection of you. And worse than that, I, I don't want you to get mad at me. My fear of a woman's anger is... Awesome. Staggering. Of a man's anger, it doesn't exist. State of California says I'm a homicidal social psychopath. That's how I deal with men's anger. Okay? I shot a few people. All right, so that's, that's that concept. You know? Woman. Ah, another story. Another story. I don't want you mad, so I'm going to keep the waters calm. I'm going to make sure everything's okay. Because I don't want to deal with your anger. Because I don't know nothing about anger, except that it's dangerous. The reason I think it's dangerous is because I got my brains beaten out by my mother when I was a small child. So I perceive a woman's anger as a real threat. I mean, I don't understand. You can just get mad. My wife and I get mad, and we, but we have to talk to each other constantly all the time. Say, hey, look, just because I get mad, it doesn't mean I don't love you and it doesn't mean I'll leave. I do love you and I won't leave, so relax. So that we can talk about whatever it is we want to talk about. And we can get mad without, without the reactions to the anger just consuming the whole house and, and nothing ever gets discussed and never, nothing ever happens. Oh, by the way, before I forget, <clears throat> you may say, well, geez, my dad knew a lot about anger. My dad was okay. He was emotionally healthy. Right? He could express his anger all the time. I mean, he expressed his anger all over the house. There's a real big difference between someone expressing their anger and someone who's, who rages. See, a lot of us were raised with raging parents. It's got nothing to do with expressing your anger. Their rage is a means of denying their feelings and controlling the house. So they rage, and everybody does what the hell they want, and everybody gets out of the way, and everybody's quiet, and everybody calms down, because they're like they're screaming and yelling and storming and stomping around the house. It's got nothing to do with what's really going on inside of them. They're as out of touch with what's happening in here as you are as what's happening inside of you. So don't ever figure raging as any sense of anger. Now, you know, you... You can get a lot of, of flack in 12-step recovery about anger. It's like, um, 
um, you know, uh, oh, anger is the dubious luxury of normal men. <laughs> I'm dealing in, in the book about anger and how necessary it is to find out that we got it and to express it. And, and I guess I wasn't strong enough on it because I sent the book off to my, my closest friend of 20 years who's also a writer. He wrote back and he said, you got to talk more about the anger, man, about suppressing the anger and how dangerous it is to suppress the anger and how suppressing of anger kills people. People rock to death when they suppress anger. You might want to remember that the line, you know, anger is the dubious luxury of normal men was written by an alcoholic, manic, depressive scam artist who smoked himself to death. <laughs> See, and I happen to love Bill and Dr. Bob. I think they were about the loosest guys who have ever been in AA. It's got tight ass ever since they, you know. Uh, I don't know where we took the turn, but they weren't saying any of the things that everybody else is saying today that are, man, you know, this is gospel. you got to do it this way. you got to do that. Man, these guys used to sit around for Christ's sakes. Dr. Bob was a drug addict. We don't want any drug addicts in AA, right? I mean, boy, that gets real interesting. These guys used to sit around Dr. Bob's house and hold seances. We're talking seances, baby. We're talking bring in the spirits and let's have a little chit-chat. Hey, you know, Ouija boards and seances. We don't even know how much of our program came from the other side, you know. <laughs> Just to really get you really nuts, I had a lunch with a real interesting guy last week in Santa Fe. He's a really he's a bright guy. He's an MD. He's written a couple of brilliant books. on, on One of the books he's written is called Healing the Child Within, which is a beautiful book on these issues. And he's a gentle little guy, just a lovely, sweet little guy. And he's working on a on a book on the on the last on the great um channeled writings of the last two hundred years, you know, like Seth Speaks and, you know, all the rest of the really the, the course of miracles, all this work came coming through people. And include and I'm reading down the list and included in his list, and this guy's not on any of the twelve step recovery programs, is the twelve steps of alcoholics now. Because Bill used to participate in automatic writing. And his secretary at the time, they had struggled and struggled and struggled and couldn't get the steps and couldn't get the steps and couldn't get the steps. He went home one night and he came back the next morning with them. And his secretary at the time said that the writing, the handwriting, was the same handwriting as when he was doing his automatic writing. Automatic writing is accepted by most experts as just, you know, something coming through. And uh, now she's since denied it, but she told too many people. <laughs> she's a little late. <laughs> so, you know... I've, it, I wouldn't get too rigid about that stuff. See, rigidity's bad, no matter what the hell you're trying to do with it. <clears throat> Where am I? I'm not aware of how I feel. I'm aware of how you feel. I'm not aware of what I want. I ask you what you want. I'm not aware. I assume. <laughs> I won't even deal with that one. Well, I look at people's faces and think I know what's going on, you know. I spent my whole life doing that, reacting to people's expressions, you know. Watch the boss walk in with a... You know, know that I'm going to be fired. Not even considering you might have gas pain. You know, it's got <laughs> nothing to do with me. So, but I would change my whole life and my whole being, you know. I remembered where I was going. <laughs> Shh, don't forget it again. <laughs> For those of us that are raised in alcoholic or dysfunctional families, there's a tremendous amount of pain in childhood. Among the things we lost, one, was our childhood. We were never allowed to be children. Two, trust. See, I don't trust nobody. Guess why? Okay, not too hard to figure that one out. The other, one of the other things I lost is self. From no sense of self. And then I lost a lot of things back there when I was a little child. Now, the natural healing process of loss is grief. Okay? You lose something, you grieve something. You see, it is the grieving, it is the crying that is the end of a loss. So if you haven't grieved over something and you haven't cried over it, you're still carrying it with you. You got it today. So, if I think back and I remember some really painful incident when I was a child where I lost trust because of what happened, it's sad. And I need to cry. Yet, 
if I cry and bring this up in the wrong setting, I will be accused of self-pity. And yet all I'm doing is grieving a loss. I'm not feeling sorry. I'm only grieving a loss. I'm convinced, and so are a lot of experts, an awful lot of nervous breakdowns are nothing more than some just heavy grieving. People just drop into grief so deep, all they can do is just curl up in a ball and cry and cry and cry. And once they're past that, they come out the other side of the grieving. This grieving thing that, that, that uh, Becky talked about, the thing, I'm not actually doing I'm doing it with another guy in Los Angeles, a guy who's worked with funeral directors for about 10 years on grief issues and done really concentrated little workshops on grief issues. And he got plugged in the ACA thing, and we got talking, and I said, hey, you and I have got to get together, man, because I want you to bring all of this knowledge about grieving to the issues for adult children of alcoholics, because we got a lot of grieving to do. And that, that's part of the process of getting well. And you'll lose a lot of friends when you start to grieve. <laughs> Prepare yourself. It makes people real uncomfortable who aren't feeling when you start to feel. Okay? And also understand your family will go nuts if you start to work on these issues. Also understand your brother was not raised in the same home you were. <laughs> no, never rarely do two siblings agree on what the family was like. You know? I mean, they just don't. They, they just see it entirely differently. Uh, my fear or your anger determines what I say or do. I use giving as a way of feeling safe in a relationship. My social circle diminishes as I involve myself with you. Emotionally healthy people have a lot of friends. Let me tell you why emotionally healthy people have a lot of friends. They learn that every little person-to-person -person situation in their life is a relationship. Okay? It's like there's this big pie. And, and if you go through the same checkout stand every time when you're at the market to, to go through the same checker, you have a relationship with her. If you always talk to the guy at the gas station, you go to the same gas station, you have a relationship with him. You may be the gardener that comes to your house. It may be the pool boy. It may be, I don't know who, but all these little people who move around in your life, you have relationships with. And, and, it's, and one of the parts of healing is to understand that, that they're not just little automatons, and you're not just a little automaton, and, and find out a little about them. Get to know these people a little bit. Find out if the checker at the market has any children, any husbands, any hopes, dreams, desires. Does she really want to be a rocket scientist and, instead of a checker? I mean, I don't know what the hell is going on, but find out who she is and tell her a little bit about you. And as you nurture these little tiny relationships, you take the stress off your primary relationship, which can't hold it anyway. I mean, no one goddamn person can do it all. Not that a codependent won't try. <laughs> And not that they aren't terribly threatened when you try and go out and nurture these other relationships, but the reality is if you can nurture those little relationships, you begin to become a person, you begin to have a lot of little friends around, and you understand that people serve a function in your life. Like there may be a person who you share movies with, and you think alike on movies, and you like the same movies, and you can talk about movies after, and you blah, 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 but you would no more want to go to a football game with a son of a bitch than a man in the moon. You know, so don't go to a football game with them. Understand that. Understand the relationship. And if he calls you up and says, Jesus, I'd like to go to dinner, say, Jesus, I'm sorry I can't make dinner. i got other plans, but I'll see you tomorrow night for the movies. Oh, okay, great. And hang out. And, 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 and know what these relationships are. See, adult children, if you grow up in a dysfunctional alcoholic home, you have no sense of limits and boundaries. Limits are how far I'll go. Boundaries are how far I'll let you go, if you've been confused by that stuff. You know, once again, it's all words. Everybody tosses it around. Nobody knows what the hell they are. Limit. How far will I go? How far will I go? Do you know that it's impossible for you to be rejected by another person? You cannot. You, the person, <clears throat> the real you inside, you cannot, under any circumstances, be rejected by another human being. All I can do is tell you what their limits are. They're not telling you what's wrong with you. They're telling you what their limits are. They may try and tell you. you know. But that's not what's happening. What's happening is they're telling you what their limitations are. That's, that's all it is. So you can't be rejected. Where are we on time here? Michael! Okay. Thank you. Love help. I put my values aside in order to connect with you. I value your opinion and way of doing things more than my own. Those are what was read at a codependency meeting. You read these books, it's in all of them. 
there's a really wonderful list of stuff. And, some, and there's a little book called um, Alcoholics, Adult Children of Alcoholic Syndrome by a guy by the name of Kurtzberg. Nice guy, good book. I like a lot of stuff in it. I disagree with some of the stuff in it, too. I disagree with some of the stuff in most of the books by most of the professionals, but at least I don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater anymore. You know, I can take out of the book what I like. There's a book I, I love called Living in the Light because she, she gets to these problems from the spiritual side. She's saying the same thing that, that everybody else is saying. You know, when you hear all these therapists and you read all these people on codependency and adult children and healing the child, which after a while you go, Jesus, give me a break. By the way, when you're healing from all this stuff, it's also nice to go for a walk and smell the flowers or, uh, you know, go to Disneyland, do something. For many people, this time may be distressing because the world situation and or our personal lives may be going from bad to worse. It's as if many things that used to work are not working anymore. I believe things are falling apart and will continue to do so in even greater intensity, but I do not feel this is negative. It will only be upsetting, <clears throat> it will only be upsetting to the degree that we are emotionally attached to our old way of living and steadfastly follow old patterns rather than try and open our eyes to the profound changes that are occurring. We try to make things work as we've been taught, and we may even enjoy some degree of success, but for most of us, things never really seem to work out as well as we had hoped. That perfect relationship never materializes, or if it does, it soon sours and fades away. We are taught from a very young age to try and be reasonable, logic, and consistent, to avoid emotional or rational behavior, and to suppress our feelings. At best, feelings and emotions are considered foolish, weak, and bothersome. At worst, we fear that they may threaten the very fabric of civilized society. Our <laughs> it's true. Our established religious institutions support this fear of the intuitive, non-rational self. Once based on a deep awareness of the universal creative principle in every being, many religions only pay lip service to that idea now. Instead, they seek to control the behavior of the devotees using elaborate rule structures purported to save people from their deep, irrational, and basically sinful natures. And according to many psychological disciplines, the dark and dangerous instinctive nature of man must be controlled. These are out of a book called Living in the Light, which is one, I mean, she's saying the same thing over here, coming at it from purely um, a, a metaphysical point of view that all the psychologists are saying that coming at it from over here. I read the book. I loved a lot of the book. Some of it I didn't like, the meditations, because they split you off. By the way, if you're in recovery and you want to work on these issues, um, learn a little about any kind of meditation that keeps you in the present and stay away from the ones that, hum, you go away, because we're very good at going away. Uh, uh, going away is not our problem. <laughs> uh, going away is our preferred activity. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> you know, so. Uh, ask me to do three hours. Of, <laughs> I'm willing, you know, but don't ask me to be here for three hours. You know, no, nah, I don't want to be there. I'll just soon go away. So, uh, uh, compulsive thinking, too, if you're trying to recover from these things, understand, I used to talk about this stuff all the time in recovery, not knowing what the hell I talked about, that was my mind was, you know, filled with voices, like 13 of them that were always talking and never could agree on anything. You know, like, ah, ah, ah. I've since learned compulsive thinking is an addiction like alcohol, drugs, sugar, caffeine, nicotine, any of the rest of them, because it cuts me off from my feelings. See, if I'm in my head, I'm not in here. So the minute I get up here, I'm gone. I've cut off. I'm, I'm, I no longer exist. I, even though I can create anxiety up here, it only seems to go about here. It seems to stop in the chest where my breathing does. You know, it's like, you know. So if you get into compulsive thinking and you're totally out of touch with your feelings and you want to stop it, the way to do that is just pay attention to where you are. Uh, you know, when I got on a green tennis shoe, my uh, my finger hurts. My, ne my next, just, just pull yourself back to get some kind of sense that there's something here. You know, there's a person. There's a person here. Pull yourself out of your head. Anyway, I read this book. I loved the book. Then I ran into a friend of mine whose intuition with people is like magical. I mean, she can spot somebody across the room and say, whoa. You know, and I go up and talk to the guy, and I'll find out he's beaten 17 women and served 20 years for rape. I mean, she's like, and he can look like an accountant. You know what I mean? I mean, she's just like, her, just, and I trust her intuition. It's wonderful with people, man. And I, and I met her, and I said, boy, I just read this great book called Living in the Light by Shakti Gwaini. She said, God, I know her. I used to work with her. I said, oh, really? She said, yeah, she's really a bitch. <laughs> I said, oh, God. You know, and I thought, well, that's okay. So she's a bitch. She wrote a great book. So if you want to read a great book by a bitch, it's called... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
called Living in the Light by Shakti Goyen. Now, okay, so what do you do about all this stuff? Okay, I got all these things. What do I do? Because we are so filled with shame, uh, the best place for us to be is in a group. So group therapy is almost more is, is actually more preferential than individual therapy because we need to expose ourselves with a little group of people who also have the same stuff going on because we're very isolated, very alone, and very ashamed. So group therapy is real, real good. Where, where do you go when you start to work on this stuff? Into probably the worst time of your life. Probably the worst time of your life. And once the feelings, but once, but if you, if your feelings have already started to come up in you, you're screwed. Because see, you already think you're nuts. See? And remember, if you're a control freak, you can't stand feelings because they don't announce themselves. You know? At five o'clock, you know, I mean, like it's 9.45 now, whatever it is, my, my, you know, my, my, my being doesn't say to me, well, Bob, about 10.30 tonight, you're gonna be sad. So, I'd get prepared for sadness if I was you. But it's only going to last about seven minutes, and then you'll have a little happiness. So it's um, seven sad, three happy at ten. Oh, okay, okay, I'll get ready. No, that's, I'm sitting at a table talking with a friend, and we're discussing automobiles, and I start to cry. That's when it comes up. You know? <laughs> and then look at you like, what, what the hell is wrong? So this is what you can look forward to. The point I'm trying to make is this. I've been in recovery from chemical dependency and free from chemicals for over 25 years. I've come to believe you can be sober, you can be, or you can be recovered. And if you're going to be recovered, you're going to work on these, you got to work on these issues. And I don't think there's any time limits. I think there's people, if they don't work on these issues, they're not going to stay free from chemicals anyway. So it doesn't matter if they start one day into recovery. I don't mind. I, I go to a lot of ACA meetings, and if the person sitting next to me at an ACA meeting has been drinking, I don't care. It doesn't bother me. I'm a, and I'm a sober alcoholic. There's no, no skin. I figure they got to be there to deal with those issues before they can even deal with the other issue. Because these issues can be so life-threatening that they can cut you off. So all I'm trying to say is, for me, it's become absolutely critical that this stuff be looked at and dealt with. I feel there's a lot of hope for my daughter. I'm, I'm, my wife and I are both thrilled and excited. We've got 37, 38 years of sobriety behind us and 20-some years of therapy behind us and a lot of work. We both have done a lot of work, man. And we figure she's got a good shot, a real good shot. Emotionally, she's got a good shot. Genetically, we realize she's screwed, <laughs> you know. So, so being realists, we'll put aside a bail bond fund before we put aside a college fund. <laughs> Just in case someone should offer a beer before we can get her past that, <laughs> past that phase in her life. So I've come from a guy who continually wiped his life out in recovery, wiped out his money, wiped out everything, wiped out relationships, had no sense of self, was always pretending. That's another thing you have to grieve when you start to recover. You have to kill off all these personalities that you've created in order to hide behind them. And they got to die. And you got to grieve them just like you're, losing, like you're losing a friend. And so there's a lot of sadness and a lot of crying. But having banged through all that stuff, God, I mean, today, man, at 52 years old, I'm a father of a four-year-old girl. Yes, of course, I realize I'm going to be 70 when she graduates from high school. I don't really care because if I continue to live like I'm living, I'm going to live to be 135 anyway, and I'm going to be in outstanding health. So, And I talked with a friend of mine whose dad was 54 when he was born. He said, you know, I didn't know my dad was old until I was 17 and somebody told me. <laughs> yeah. So um, I guess the most important thing, I was sitting in the airport in, 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 in Albuquerque this morning having a little bowl of oatmeal with a sliced banana on top. And... Um, a glass of water and I'm tired and you know and the baby keeps us up and we're on her schedule instead of her on ours which is fine with us and and I'm sitting here next to a mirror right here on the wall I'm sitting at the counter in the airport I looked over and I looked at my face and me looking back at me and of course it's a person there now so things have changed a lot and I looked at this guy looking back at me in the mirror and I'm really tired this morning I was just whipped and I just smiled you know the man in the mirror looking back at me is such just, God, I like him. God, I like him. He's a good guy. You know? I never felt like that in my life. Never felt like that in my life. Now I see me in mirrors and windows and things and I smile. I smile. There's a person here. And for you guys that think, you know, getting soft and gentle, you're going to become a wimp and people are going to walk over you. The reality is, it's harder for people today to walk on me than when I was a tough guy. 
I don't let people get away with crap today. No, you can't overcharge me, Nicole. No, you cannot put me on the next flight. No, you cannot. No, you cannot. But I'm sorry, I'm eating dinner. I do not have time. You do not have a gun in your mouth. The hammer is not pulled back. Call me after my meal has been consumed by me. You know, I mean, it's like I don't, I don't do it anymore. I don't sell me out anymore for life. So anyway, all tonight was intended to do from my point of view is to give you some information that I hope helps you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.